The world of Parasport is more than medals and accolades. Join hosts Greg Westlake and Travis Morrow as they delve deeper and examine the important issues impacting sport. This is Beyond the Field. Hello and welcome to the show. I'm Greg Westlake. Being a high performance athlete is a costly endeavor. Thankfully in Canada, the best of the best receive funding from Sport Canada's Athlete Assistance Program, or AAP. To earn that funding though, you must first be chosen or carded by one of the few national sport organizations funded under the program. While AAP isn't perfect, it does have its benefits. Later in the show, Travis chats with Danielle Duplessis about the tuition support program, which is another key benefit of AAP. But first, we go to my conversation with carded Paralympic Nordic athlete, Christina Picton. Before taking up cross country and biathlon, Christina played her entire para hockey career without any funding, despite being one of the best female players in all the world. Competing with and without AAP support has given Christina a unique perspective. Christina, thank you so much for joining us today. How you doing? I'm doing so well. How are you doing, Greg? I'm doing amazing. Thanks for asking. Uh, you know, Christina, when I first heard of you, you were invited to the Men's National Para Hockey Selection Camp, and it was an amazing feat in itself because you were the first woman ever to be invited to the camp. Just tell me a bit about your experience that week. It's really hard to to talk about it without talking about the the 15 years of my career that kind of led me to that point. Like. It was an honor to be there. It was an honor to be the first women, woman um, a part of that selection camp and to kind of showcase that the women's game is developing and getting to the level where it, we can compete with the men for the top spots in, in our country. Well, that's the reason I asked Christina is because almost every guy that you were on the ice with at that tryout camp at some point in their hockey journey has been carded and has received funding so that they can train and be the best athlete they can be. Have you ever received any type of financial funding to support your hockey goals? No, I've never been funded for hockey in the 17 years that I played. Um, yeah, that's why it was such a hard question to like start off with. Like, I feel like there's so much more to like lead into that one experience, <laughs> but yeah. So after 17 years of training, competing, and trying to reach the highest level of your sport with zero funding, can you just give us some insight as to how the funding would have changed your training and really your life? It would have relieved so much financial and, and emotional stress, like being a full-time athlete without the support of, you know, um, IST support or the funding and the, even the coaching and the strength coaching resources that are available to carded athletes like to have had to have balanced all of that as well as working full time and you know just funding your way through through sport to, to, to hopefully get a team to the Paralympic Games uh, one day it was a really draining experience but you do it because you love the game so much and you know you're a part of an incredible program and an incredible um, group of women that are all just like fighting to prove themselves in our sport and in our in our hockey community. Um, so as difficult as it was, like I wouldn't change anything about it. Uh, like my journey is my journey and it got me to where I am today. So I'm really grateful for it. Christina, you bring up a great point that it's not just the financial support athletes get uh, when they're carded athletes. You get access to the coaching, the strength coach, the nutritionist, the sports psychologist, and all the things that really help the athletes become the best version of themselves. Uh, so I have to ask, how did you raise the money all those years when you weren't a carded athlete? Did you have family support? Did you have to go out there and fundraise yourself? What made the dream happen for you? It was a combination of a lot of things to get the funds for different events like so yeah I worked full-time as a graphic designer so that was like basically funding my hockey career um, and I, I was living at home still and I um, yeah I wasn't saving a ton that's for sure um, and and like I did mention before with like hockey comes uh, like injuries so there's chiropractic care there's like all of the support staff side of things that that was coming out of you know my own pocket and my parents were were gracious enough to let me live with them and you know there was no rent there which is really nice but you know you get to a certain age and you're ready to move out that's for, <laughs> that's for sure 
Fair enough. You know, you know, Christina, did you ever have any friends, teammates, or colleagues in the game drop out and stop competing because they couldn't afford to play anymore? Oh yeah, I witnessed a lot of women stop playing. I feel like it was uh, at least one or two every season where the financial burden just became too much or I, I can think of women that took out second, third mortgages on their houses so that they could continue to play and represent Canada just to play the sport that they love and to to fight for that for that position and for that dream of going to the Paralympics and representing Canada on, on the international stage. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry to hear that you lost teammates and friends uh, for financial reasons, uh, which leads me to my next question. You made the switch from para hockey over to para Nordic. And was the switch to para Nordic about the fact that they have a karting system, they're in the Paralympic games? What made you want to make the change? There was a lot of different factors for me to, to transition over to that sport. And I think the main one was that I had gotten as far as I could in para ice hockey. Like I was that first woman at those that men's selection camp and that felt like the farthest I could get uh, with the support and with the resources that I had. Um, I was starting to just crave more and I got, uh, I was very lucky to, to be introduced to Robin McKeever and Colin Cameron early on in my skiing and I could see the potential and they could see the potential in me. So it was really, it was just came at a really great time where I was ready to push my own like limits as an athlete. And then for there to actually be support there and like they were so, they welcomed me into the program and welcomed me into the, the community. So it was really hard to say no, <laughs> yeah. I love to hear that you're having such a great time training and competing in para Nordic, but I have to ask, would you even be in this spot if you were a fully carded para hockey player? Um, that's a really great question. Um, maybe, maybe not. No, I think maybe I was so focused on para ice hockey that if I had been fully carded and um, had the support that I have in skiing, I, I don't see why I would, would have turned away from like the sport that ignited my passion for sport and being active and leading like a healthy lifestyle. Like the, hockey was what started it all for me, yeah. Christina, what I see is we just lost one of our great female para hockey ambassadors, all because we don't fund the women's game. Now you're gonna go off, become a famous para Nordic skier and start a whole new generation of Canadian skiers. Am I seeing that right? That is one way you could put it. Yeah, I guess, <laughs> unfortunately. I mean, I'm still trying to stay involved as on the, like off the ice, I'm still doing work for our women's national program, like design stuff. And I'm, I'm, just trying, I'm still trying to be a mentorship mentor as much as I can be. Uh, but yeah, my, my attention is fully on skiing and biathlon and what I can do in the next four years. Yeah. Well, that's incredible, Christina. And I know that we're gonna be watching and cheering you on. And I just wanna thank you so much for joining us today. You're not just one of Canada's best female athletes. You're just one of Canada's best athletes. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Greg. More to come on Beyond the Field. You're watching Beyond the Field. Welcome back, I'm Travis Morrell. Before the break, Greg spoke to Christina Pickton about the benefits of and gaps in Sport Canada's Athlete Assistance Program. Another aspect of AAP worth discussing is the tuition support program. For every year an athlete is carded, they're eligible for a $5,500 stipend for schooling. Earlier, I caught up with Canadian wheelchair basketball Paralympian Danielle Duplessis to discuss how she has benefited from that support and why others should take advantage. Danielle, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. So Danielle, how long have you been playing wheelchair basketball? Um, I have been playing sort of recreationally for about four years and then I joined the women's national team in 2019. So it's been three years of kind of high performance sport. Holy cow, so you've made the national team in actually a relatively short amount of time of playing. I did, yeah. It was a super quick transition for me as someone who had played stand-up basketball before. I think it made the flip easier. So it was about a year from sort of like sitting in a chair to playing in Lima, which was a crazy transition. 
the quick one. So how long have you been carded under the Athlete Assistance Program? Um, sort of same timeline. I've been carded since 2019 with at the start a development card and now a senior card. So you started with a development card first. What's, mm -hmm. a, what's a development card for those who don't know? Yeah, so there's sort of this tiered system when it comes to the way that Canada and like the federal government is able to support our athletes. So each team is allocated a certain number of cards and those are like athlete sort of stipends. And so development players or players who are sort of on the come up but maybe not on the senior team yet receive a lower amount of money, which is a development card with some added bonuses like a tuition scholarship and things like that. And then sort of as you rise up and get to the senior team or go to a major, for example, you get upgraded to a senior card, which is worth a little bit more money and has a couple more perks attached. What was that transition like for you to go from a development card to a senior card? Like as an athlete, how, what did that take for you? Yeah, I mean, for me, it was a couple years of work. Like I really had to give a big push. So I, I got the development card when I was living in New Brunswick and training alone a lot. <laughs> and in order to sort of make that next step and make the women's team and be able to sort of contribute on the court, I ended up moving to Toronto to train full time at the National Academy. So after I graduated from university in Mount Allison in New Brunswick, I moved to Toronto to kind of give it a go and see, I guess within the, the three year time span before Tokyo, how far I could take it. <laughs> And it went okay. So that was that was it for me, was like this big push, a ton of training, and trying to really focus in on improving at wheelchair basketball to make the senior team. And then I guess a happy side effect there is the upgrade to the senior card. So you spoke about completing university before making this big push uh, to make the, the national team. But now that you mm -hmm. are on the national team, um, I've heard that you've accessed the tuition support program to continue your education. Can you take me through that? Yeah, I feel like if you know me, it's uh, everyone's like, wow, you're still in school. <laughs> um, that's the reaction a lot. So I finished my undergrad in 2018. I graduated with a bachelor's in cognitive science from Mount Allison. And then I played for about a year in Toronto full time. And was a little like, I want to say maybe understimulated by only playing basketball. And through the, car the carding program, you have access to uh, a scholarship as well. I believe it's up to $25,500 in sort of $5,000-ish increments every year to support your tuition. And so once I learned about that, it was kind of a no-brainer to go back to school because it was a pretty low risk. Like I'm not spending my own money. I have sort of this flexibility and I was able to find a good balance between grad school supervisors who would like support me in playing wheelchair basketball and basketball coaches who thought it was important that I go to grad school. So I have to say, just as an observation, you're crushing the number side of things. I can see why you're such a good student. <laughs> <laughs> so was, was going back to school always a part of the, pro, uh, the plan, knowing that you had this access to tuition support? Yeah, it for sure factored in. Um, I think like a lot of folks who graduate with bachelor's degrees, there was like this sort of now what moment, like what do I do with the bachelor's in cognitive science? And so it was really nice for me to have the option to go back and have the flexibility to go back because I did need more education and more training in order to be sort of employable in the fields that I wanted to work in. So I did a master's yeah, in cognitive rehabilitation to start and I've kind of continued on since then. Beyond the, beyond the master's? Yeah, I'm in another, <laughs> yes, I'm in a doctoral program now, training to be a, a child psychologist. So Holy lots cow. of school in the cards for me. <laughs> so, so what would you tell a younger athlete who's maybe hasn't accessed the tuition sport program or is maybe considering it for their future? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think things to know are that it's a beautiful way to like, it's, it's hard, it can be hard to commit to school right off the bat because you maybe don't know what you want to take. But I think the tuition and sports stipend does a really good job of giving you space to explore also with low risk. And so you can take different courses, you can take an extra year to finish your degree, you have those five years of tuition support. So it's really nice in that way. And so the way that I use the tuition stipend as a master's and PhD student is that I use it to pay my tuition and then I get to keep more of my stipend. So, so there's lots of angles, there's lots of ways to work it, but for the most part, 
I would say just go for it. The money is sitting there for you. And it's also worth noting that it doesn't expire. So when you retire, you can still access that money as a scholarship for five years. And so it's, it's a pretty great amount of support. So the tuition support program, that's just one part of the AAS, AAP support program. What do you think of the program as a whole? Do you think it's adequate? Do you think there's room for expansion? I think it's a, it's a beautiful start for athletes. Um, I am super appreciative of the support and I know that not all countries and not all sports have sort of the same level of support as Canadian athletes. At the same time, it's not a ton of money. <laughs> and so as someone who had to move to Toronto to play my sport, it was an intimidating prospect knowing that I was getting $20,000-ish as a yearly stipend, right? And living on that in Toronto especially, but almost anywhere in Canada, is it's a bit of a crunch. And so I think there have been some recent and really sort of of the moment, I guess, discussions around increasing the stipends to reflect like inflation in rent, inflation in cost of living for athletes, and to make sure that athletes are, are better supported and less maybe financially strained by their training. Thank you so much for joining us today on this interview. You've shared some incredible insights into the AAP program and best of luck in the future. Thank you. Stay tuned for more Beyond the Field This is Beyond the Field. Welcome back to Beyond the Field. I'm your host, Greg Westlake, with my co-host, Travis Morrow. We're talking AAP funding today. Travis, you've been a part of the, as people know it in Canada, the carding system. How do you feel about the program? I think it's an amazing program in that it provides support for us so that we can train at the highest levels without necessarily having to worry and stress about paying the mortgage, paying for groceries, paying for all your foods. But... I think there's a lot further it could go in that. It puts us just above the poverty line as athletes. And man, for the guys supporting families, for the guys uh, who are living in the more expensive parts of the province, it can be a real challenge making ends meet. I noticed that you took advantage of the tuition support program. What was that like for you? Well, I, I did, and that, that was one of my early first kind of reasons I wanted to play Paralympic sport was I, I wanted to get my tuition paid for. And every year that you are a carded athlete in Canada, you get one year of your schooling paid for. So my original plan, just because I thought it would feel good to go home and say I got a scholarship, was to not have my parents pay my tuition. So the government of Canada was able to do that for me, and it was a point of pride for me. And so my original plan was play, get my education, and move on. But then, of course, you know, I ended up going to five games and fell in love with, with playing. Um, but at least it wasn't... Finances never became a reason why I exited the sport, which was amazing. Uh, did you ever take advantage of the uh, AAP? So I took a different route you, than you in that I started in school. And then once I made the national team, I was like, oh, school. I'll come back to that later. I mean, I've got tons of time. And now, 20 years later, I'm looking more towards the twilight of the, my career. And I'm looking at the tuition support program. And I think it's the greatest thing in the world because it's going to give me some opportunities that I wouldn't necessarily have uh, leaving the sport. Do you think that more and more athletes are going to be taking advantage of that program now that it's become more popular and that they've seen more athletes have success with it? Well, I hope so. But, but I, I think the one thing that I would encourage all young athletes to do is, is to hustle and to grind. If you just rely on what's given out, it's not enough. And, and I don't mean to be a jerk about it, but it's not. And, and what we see right now is if you want to use the word that's so popular right now, inflation, the carding has remained the same or maybe got a little $500 bump in 20 years. But it has basically stayed the same. If you were an athlete in 1996, you were making the same AAP carding money as you are today. That's what I find insane is here we are 20 years later and nothing has changed from the government. Uh, and that bothers me. It, it, it should rise as everything around us is rising as well. But that's just one issue I see. Is there any issues you see with the program? I think... I think there's a lack of opportunity for, for athletes within the program beyond the AAP funding where you have your RBC Olympian grants and Paralympic grants and you have your CIBC training ground grants, but those grants and those scholarships and those bursaries are few and far between, especially for student athletes. So if we could see more corporate sponsorships step up to the plate and provide these grants and scholarships, I think it would make a big difference in the support we feel as Canadian athletes. Can you see any other areas where 
we've got room to, to expand the AAP program? Absolutely. I think we need more for the grassroots. I, I think for, for us to specifically target athletes, because that's what we do with the Olympics and the Paralympics, is we convert from other sports. We, we find people with disabilities, and, and we, we find a, a route and a sport that fits that athlete. But if we can find a way to provide some funding for those high performance people that we found at a young age, like an RBC Performance Ground, we go find this amazing young athlete. Well, is there even just the littlest bit of funding we can give them to kind of kickstart their journey? You know, like we already talked about in different episodes of Beyond the Field, um, the entry to Paralympic sport is expensive. The equipment is expensive. So if there's some way that we can take this AAP and help some of the really good targeted young athletes get into the sport sooner, I think we'll produce more medals. And isn't ultimately that's what we're trying to do here. Competition is about winning. I couldn't agree with more with you, Greg. I think one of the most important things for us to do is to help the Paralympic movement grow in all of the countries around the world. And that's going to help us and all of our athletes achieve greater success in the future. I agree. And listen, it's a loaded topic, funding in Olympic and Paralympic sport. The AAP system isn't perfect, but it's great. I know I'm thankful for all the support I've received over the years. I am too, for sure. But unfortunately, that's all the time we have today. For Travis and myself, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for watching Beyond the Field. We'll catch you next time. Hosts Greg Westlake, Travis Murau, producer Ted Cooper, associate producer Alex Smythe, director of photography Matthew McGurk, videographer Jarrett Holt, senior editor Matthew McGurk, editors Nathan Clement, Daniel Waldman, narration Bill Hunt, media accessibility specialist Ron Rickford, audio post Mark Phoenix, color Adam Kemp, graphics Mike Smith, Andrew Antonello, senior producer Michelle Dudas, President and CEO David Arrington. Copyright 2022, Accessible Media Inc.